before we start, let me acknowledge the people of Kunlun Nations on whose land our major campuses operate. And I broadcast from today, I pay my respect to their elderly, past and present. With online learning and remote working, people may be based elsewhere or interstate. So I pay my respects to traditional owners of the land from wherever you may be joining us. Welcome to Monash Lecture Series on Behavior uh, Economics. My name is Erta Zhao. I'm a professor at the Department of Economics from Monash University. This series is organized by me and my colleagues, Xiaojian Zhao. Um, the name of the series is to bring leading scholars on le uh, to lecture on frontier topics in the field of behavior economics. Today, I'm really glad to have John List from University of Chicago to kick off the lecture series. We are also pleased to have our Dean of the Monash uh, Business School, Simon Wilkie, join us today, who will introduce John in a moment. Given the large number of attendees, uh, we will only allow short clarifying questions during the talk. There will be a 30 minutes Q&A discussion after the talk. So if you have any questions, would like to discuss or comment, please join the discussion then. To ask the questions, please raise your hand our graduate student, Dan uh, Grodek, uh, will be here to help with moderating the questions. Uh, you may also type your questions in the chat box if you wish, uh, just simply like us to read the question for you. Also, I have a good news for all the participants today. Uh, we're going to have a lottery after the talk. 50 <laughs> participants uh, will be the lucky winners, and the award will be John's uh, new book, The Voltage Effect. So look for your emails. We'll send you um, the notice if you're the winner. Thanks. So now uh, next we'll have uh, Simon to introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Ate. Uh, I thought maybe the winner gets a paper in the JPE. That would be, <laughs> <laughs> that could interesting. be. <laughs> interesting. I like that, Simon. I think it, it's less costly for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our speaker today and also our distinguished former colleague, uh, Professor John Lifts uh, from the University of Chicago, where he serves as the Kenneth C. Griffin Distinguished Service Professor. Um, John uh, has followed on uh, my former, my co-author Phil Rennie has also served as chair of the economics department at um, the University of Chicago. And we're very happy to have him here to talk on the lecture, uh, the voltage effect in behavioral economics. Uh, before handing over to John, I just wanted to uh, tell him one anecdote consistent with his work when I was at, at Microsoft. Um, we had a there's a process where things come from the labs to uh, something called the garage to be prototyped to be turned into products and then you get presented to the management team and then the thing that kills it is the line i don't see a billion dollars it was dead <laughs> so every, everybody's idea you had to back reverse engineer how this was a billion dollar exactly. year market exactly. so just to <laughs> let you know all right take it away john I, I love that, Simon. Thanks so much. And um, everyone, thanks so much for having me, Erta and colleagues. Thank, thank you so much for having me. I am uh, now I'm going to do the hardest part of the lecture for me, and that's trying to share my own slides. So, so Erta, can maybe oh, you should unshare yeah, and then, and then yeah. I try to share? Let's see if this yeah, will work for me. Yeah, I should uh, stop sharing here. Uh, how come I don't see the stop sharing? Okay, oh, now, okay, good. One Did I stop sharing? Yeah. Yeah. I think we're good there. Uh, Erta, are we good? Yeah, it's all good. Okay, very good. As, as Simon mentioned, um, it's really nice to be, quote, back. Um, I know we're virtual, which is unfortunate, but um, I, I spent a, a fair amount of time at Monash, and I still have a lot of good friends and colleagues there who are also on the line, so I, I really appreciate your support. I think you will see that there is some contribution in the book 
um, and some very important contributions in the book that are with colleagues at Monish. And I'll, I'll bring some of those up today when I, when I talk through the book. Now, as, um, as Simon mentioned, the book is basically about, and, and has as its core, why do so many ideas or policies fail to deliver on their promise when scaled? Now, in my own academic work, this is something that I've shorthand called the science of using science. Okay, and I'll, I'll come back to that throughout the lecture. Now, I know that Erta said that 50 lucky people will get the book. I'm going to raise the stakes a little bit. And I'm going to do something that I've, I've just started. I've tried this twice. So this is going to be the third time. I want to run an experiment to start my, my uh, keynote lecture today. So here's the experiment. Your simple chore is to guess an integer, one to 100 inclusive. You can guess one or 100 should you like. I want you to guess what you think will be two thirds of this group's average guess. Now, as an experimental economist, we've all learned that incentives matter. So this incentive will be a signed copy and you can have me inscribe whatever you want and I will send it from America. I will pay for all shipping and I will send it to you, a signed copy of, of a book that I'm gonna talk about today titled The Voltage Effect. Now, there's a bonus book opportunity as well because the form I'm gonna have you fill out will also ask you, what do you think the equilibrium of this game is? Okay, so here's the tricky part now for an old professor like me. I am told if you scan this QR code, so right now I wanna see everybody holding up their phone to get the QR code because you will then get a survey that you will complete, hopefully, with your, your email and your two guesses. And again, what I want is, what do you think will be two thirds of this group's average? And I want you to guess what you think the theoretical equilibrium is to this game. Okay, so I'll give you a few moments. If anyone needs me to go back, to show you the first page of the instructions. I can certainly do that. And at the end of today's lecture, I will announce the winner of the first part and then also the winner of the second part. Now, if multiple people get the right equilibrium, I will randomly choose one of them, okay? I, I just can't afford to send more than two books overseas on the Pony Express. Are there any questions? Now, this is an official experiment, okay? I will not attach your name to any of your guesses, but I will take your data and talk about it maybe later in, uh, in my next talk when I'm in Melbourne. Okay, again, everyone, I want you to do this. Your simple chore, guess an integer, guess an integer one to 100 inclusive. Guess has to be an integer. I will exclude the ones that are not. Also look carefully, it's one to 100, hint, hint. Can't be outside that range. Okay, and if anyone again needs the, the QR code, here you go. At the end of the lecture, I'll come back and I'll talk about the two winners and we'll We'll tie this a little bit into the lecture today uh, because I think if you answered this question correctly, you used a little bit of game theory. And the, the theoretical approach in the work that I'm going to be talking about today is, is using game theory to explore the theoretical implications of scaling. Okay, so we'll kind of come back to um, game theory in a few slides here. 
OK, so let's get started. Now, the, the new way of presenting, I guess, is to tell you right away what I want you to take away from today's lecture. So I'm going to give that a, a try. OK, so first of all, I'm going to teach you about what the voltage effect is. This is not engineering that we're going to be talking about. It's economics. And I'm going to argue that this stylized fact is nearly a law. Now, in economics, we're not as cool as in physics, where the physicists have these great quantitative laws, and they are true laws. In economics, we have these kind of fake laws, right? Like the law of demand, the law of supply, the law of comparative advantage. These are more or less qualitative laws. And this will also be a sort of qualitative law, which I'm calling the voltage effect. And I'll define in a few slides what I mean by voltage effect. Now, in thinking about scaling an idea, I argue in the book, it's really about the DNA of the policies or ideas that we're talking about. And that DNA has to have what I call the five vital signs of any idea or policy. If it doesn't have the five vital signs, I will argue it will likely have problems scaling. And Simon brought up one, extent of market, which is what a lot of business folks talk about. Now, oftentimes when we talk about scaling or using research, we have people bantering about claiming evidence-based policy, evidence-based this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to try to convince you today that when you're talking about scaling, that's the exact backwards way to think about using data in the experimental approach. We really should be thinking about what I call a more dominant species, which is policy based to evidence. Now, finally, in that world, we are not primarily going after learning about measuring an intervention effect and thinking about whether an intervention works, but we're going beyond that to not only measure, but to ask why, for whom, where, under what terms, and at what cost. It, it's that type of knowledge that is necessary before we can even think about scaling. Okay, so those are kind of the broader four points that I want you to take away from today's lecture. So let's turn back the clock now and say where we are now. So all of us on this call have probably done a little bit of theory and a little bit of empirical work. And when I started to do field experiments back in the early 90s, I was really focused on one, using the world as my lab. And I basically had a unidimensional approach that I wanted to, first of all, use field experiments to test theory, and then set up an optimal design so I could generate data to show intervention effects. That, that's the typical way that we think about the empirical approach and making causal inference. Now, what I argue in the book is the next frontier is we should be asking from the very beginning, can that idea or policy scale? And what is the science behind that idea? Now, in that way, I'm going to show you today that from the very inception of your research idea or approach or program, if you have this notion of, in the end, I want to scale, your research approach from the beginning will be different than if you're trying to generate a causal treatment effect or a causal parameter from a theory, OK? So let me tell you a little bit about my scaling road. So my scaling road essentially started when a community just south of Chicago called Chicago Heights called me up and said, John, we are willing to open up our school district. And we would like you to come into our school district 
and help us improve our school district. Now, when you say something like that to a person like me, this is like um, opening the candy shop to a, a 10 year old child, right? Because if somebody is willing to open up their entire school district to an experimental exploration, this is exactly what I've always asked for in trying to learn about how we can use economics to change the world. So where we essentially started in Chicago Heights was to look at 14, 15, and 16-year-olds and how to keep those kids in school. Now you can ask, well, why did you start with 14, 15, and 16 year olds? The reason why, and I talked about this during my last trip to Melbourne, is that the, the high schools down in Chicago Heights, you know, maybe a thousand kids will start the ninth grade every year. That's when high school starts in the States. Only about 480 of those kids will end up graduating from high school. The other 520 will drop out. So this is that kind of school district. It's a school district that you can really say the entire community has been left behind by the modern economy. Um, families, uh, buildings, um, infrastructure, et cetera, is essentially in ruins. This is the way I think about many urban settings around America is that we tend to have broken public education uh, school systems. So when I started that series of, of field experiments to try to explore the education production function, what you immediately are met with is a population of people who are 14, 15, and 16 years old, but they're reading at a seven-year-old level, or they're doing math at a second grade level. And by the time the child is 15 or 16 years old and is seven years behind their cohort, it's very, very difficult to unleash, let's say their full potential. A lot of their potential has been lost. And at that point, you can still do good. There's no doubt about it, but it's really, really hard to be a game changer in a deep way when you start with a child who's 15 or 16 and just on the brink of dropping out. Okay, so after that initial experience, what we decided to do is go back to the beginning of their lives and attempt to put together programs for zero to five-year-olds where we could have a much better chance to change the course of life of these children. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today is the Chicago Heights Early Childhood Center and the pre-K programs that we built for three, four and five year olds. Now these are basically from scratch programs that we put together so we could affect the lives and the trajectories of these families and our target population was the three, four, and five-year-olds, okay? So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to summarize a little bit about years one and two in our experimental design, just to make the point about that I'm trying to make about scaling. Okay, so years one and two, there were about 1,500 children who signed up. Their parents signed them up, or their grandma or grandpa signed them up. And we randomized those 1,500 kids into five different treatment cells. Okay, so if you were in treatment cell, what I'm calling group one or group two here, these are programs whereby you received an all-day pre-K program. You showed up at 9 or 9.30 in the morning. You were done at 3.30 in the afternoon. The school year started in September and it ended in June. The only difference between groups one and two is that in group one, we used a curriculum called Tools of the Mind. This is a curriculum that the experts told us should push executive function skills of little kids. Group two 
we use a different curriculum called Literacy Express. The experts told us that this particular curriculum should push cognitive skills. Okay, and then we'll test that. I'll show you some figures where we test that. So that, that, that's group one, that's group two. Now, some kids were placed in group three, group four, or group five. As you can see, we have a pretty big control group, that's group five. So there are about 728 kids in years one and two who received nothing from us. But this is not the typical medical trial to where we give them a sugar pill and it's really not gonna make them better. That, that's not what we did here. We told them, thank you for signing up. We wanna continue the conversation, but you will not be receiving any formal treatment from us. And then they could go out and get treatment from somebody else should they want. Okay, we're not gonna stop that. Now in groups three and four, these are groups where we never taught the child directly. What we did is we set up a parent academy whereby we taught the child's parents. We taught them different, let's say pedagogical approaches that they could use with their child to push their cognitive and non-cognitive uh, human capital skill formation, okay? The only difference between groups three and four is that in group three, we incentivized parents with cash payments and they could earn up to $7,500 per year. $7,500 was chosen because that was our budget for each child in groups one and two. So we were setting the budgets equal. In group four was a parent academy whereby we put most of the incentive in a college tuition fund. And the idea is when their child goes to college, they can then draw down that fund to be used for tuition and fees. Okay, so the idea here now between groups three and four is we are trying to set up different marginal benefits for investments uh, for the parent to the child. Group three obviously gives a very strong incentive early on and group four gives an, a, a much less incentive early on but as a continuous stream, we hope. These kids are now sophomores and juniors in high school and we've tracked them all the way through so far and we're still tracking these kids, okay? So, so that's the design of years one and two. We also did years three and four, but we won't go through that today. So here are some summary results. So what I have here is on the y-axis, I have percentile change. So these are cognitive test scores that are nationally normed. They're called Woodcock-Johnson. The first bar in each case is from September to January, okay, for each of the four treatments compared to the control. The second bar is the second half of the school year. Okay, so two things jump out when we talk about cognitive test scores. First of all, the Preschool Literacy Express does really, really well. Okay, that's exactly what the experts told us should happen. Now, secondly, what happens in nearly every group is that most of the gains, except for tools of the mind, it's still a little bit more, but it's not as big as the difference in Literacy Express. Most of the gains come early on. And then it, it gets smaller in the second half of the year, okay? Uh, John, now, sorry, John. There's a yeah, question. go ahead. There's a question from the audience. Um, Simon asked, does group four get interest? Yes, it, it is put in a uh, hedge fund account. Does that help, Simon? Um, this this um, project is funded by Ken Griffin, who started Citadel Investments. Okay. Yeah, he says good. Okay, um, now you can do the same thing on executive function and that's exactly what we have here. The, the issue here though is these are more or less explorations that are in their infancy. When you talk about evaluating someone's executive function skills, think about um, the willingness to share, teamwork, um, 
trust, uh, the ability to take chances, uh, self-control, all of what people call soft skills. No, these are not nationally norm. And these are kind of a series of explorations that we took from the literature, measurement tools we take from the literature, and we invent some ourselves. So we're a little bit innovative here too. This is just one of those executive function skills, but it gives you, in general, they all kind of paint the same picture. Again, early on, you, you see the most growth. And then the tools of the mind effectively does a good job for executive function skills. Okay. So from there, you can imagine how excited I am to create this program. Um, if any, any of you don't know me, I, I become a little bit like a kid on Christmas morning when I, when I get data from an experiment and something like this that, that I think can be so important. It's, uh, you can tell that I'm just exhilarated when the data start to come in. So here's my past self, throw me back to like 2014. A lot of you probably saw me about how excited I was when I visited Melbourne. So I claimed, I said, every kid in the world should have this program. I, I, I did it not to sell it. I did it because I want every kid in the world to get this program for free. So I have binders and binders of this curriculum that I want every kid in the world to receive because it's a means tested field experimental approach to develop a great curriculum for three, four, and five-year-olds. Then I received a slap in the face. And the slap in the face was from a, many policymakers. Professor List, your program had an impressive benefit profile, but don't expect it to scale. I say, why? They answer, it doesn't have the silver bullet. I'm like, what is a silver bullet? What are you talking about? They say, all of the experts always tell us their interventions are so great, but when we roll them out, the results aren't close to what they promise. And then I say, well, why do you think that is? If indeed it's true, why do you think that's true? And they say, you know what? There's this group of implementation scientists. They tell us it's because of fidelity but we just don't know. So at this point, I said, I really want to explore, first of all, does this really happen? Are there a bunch of empty promises that when you actually try to scale the policy or the idea, it ends up really, really tiny in comparison to what happened in the Petri dish. So I go through the literature and do a ton of exploration. And indeed that's true. And this is what I call the voltage effect. It's making a mountain into a molehill. You have a great result in the Petri dish or in Chicago Heights. But when you scale that up, that mountain of a result becomes a molehill when you roll it out to everyone or to a larger group of people or situations. That, folks, is then what hit me into saying, I need to explore this problem more deeply, and I need to understand the science of how we should be thinking about science. Okay, so where did we start? What we did is like any good economist will do is we started writing down theoretical models because to me, theoretical models give you some insights that your imagination in many cases has a hard time to give you. It might flash the, the flashlight in parts of the dark room where you've never even known something might exist. So we essentially put together a game theoretic model and our actors in that model were thinking a lot like all of you when you were looking around and saying, 
well, I wonder what number I should guess. If there are a bunch of random people in this experiment, the average guess is going to be 50, so I'm going to guess 33. That was you trying to put yourself in the shoes of other people when we did that experiment at the beginning of my lecture, okay? Now, for me, we had to define the actors in the development of science and the scaling of a program. The major actors in that particular game are researchers like all of us, policymakers like some of you, practitioners, you have funders who are part of this game, and then you have experimental participants who are part of our experiments, but they also get the good stuff from the policy that the policymaker enacts, okay? So we put all of that together. We have a bunch of math, bunch of equations. I'll, I'll show you some of the papers at the end of my lecture if you wanna go and read them. And then we combine those theories, theoretical predictions with what I would call DNA evidence. I want to go and scour the literature when people tried things in the small and tried to go larger with it and try to explore when it worked, when it didn't work, and why didn't it work. Okay, so the DNA evidence I'm going to talk about today, and it's also in the book, really comes from a comparison of thousands of studies alongside the theory that is, is in the academic papers. Okay, that's what I call the science of using science. Now, my thesis today is, unlike what the experts and policymakers told us, this isn't a silver bullet problem. The problem is about finding ideas that it's a weakest link problem that have the five vital signs. And in a way, it's like an Anna Karenina problem. And I'll come back to that at the end as well. Now, once you figure out if your idea has or passes the five vital signs, even if it doesn't, if it passes three or four, the five vital signs give you a sense of the depth or breadth of your idea or policy. As Simon said, People had ideas and then they would go to the decision makers and they said, well, if it's not a billion dollar idea, we don't want to do it. Sometimes we do want to do ideas that are hundred million dollar ideas, but it's important to know from the outset, what kind of idea is this before we roll it out to everyone or before we spend a lot of money on it as a business proposition. Okay, that, that's my thesis today. Now what I wanna do is I wanna talk a little bit one by one about the five vital signs. And remember these vital signs are basically an accounting exercise of more or less what comes from the first order conditions in the theory and also what the empirical literature has taught me that are the five most important things when it comes to scaling. Okay, and the first one is what I call the inference problem. And the inference problem for all the academics, this will be old hat. What I'm essentially talking about here is false positives or are the initial data lying? You know, a more um, appropriate way to say, uh, are the data lying is, do we have statistical error? And that's, we can think about when we set alpha equal to 0.05, when the sample diverts from the population. Now, in this case, the import of replication becomes very clear. Now, let's think about what's going on with Chicago Heights. So what I have here is an equation, which I'm calling the post-study probability. So I'm getting a little bit Bayesian here. Um, one minus beta, is the power of the experiment. Pi will be my prior or my belief about whether the experiment will work. And then down here, I have the significance level. So this is just, this is coming directly from the stats literature. And we, we wrote about this in a 2014 paper with Maniitis and uh, Tufano, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that 
I hear that John List is running this experiment in Chicago Heights. And let's say, you know what? That's a crazy idea. Even though he's well-powered, a power of 0.8, John's well-powered. My prior that that's going to work is 1%. Okay? So now I come with the data. The data show the program works. Here's how much you update your post-study probability. Before you thought it had a 1% chance of being real, you only go to 2%. <laughs> A lot of times when you talk to policymakers, they say it was published in a peer-reviewed journal, so it must be the truth. Well, if it's a surprise, the truth is it's going to work one out of 50 times after you read my study. Now, you can say, well, what about after one replication? Now it goes to 10%. What about two replications? Now it goes to 47%. All I'm doing is using this equation. And I have all the tables in that AER paper that I mentioned with Montiitis and Tufano. Um, go, to, go to three replications. Now we're kind of in business, right? N now we're up to 91%, and we can be much more confident that this is not a false positive. That's what this first bin really is talking about, or the first vital sign. Using common sense and making sure that you have the truth before we spend a lot of money doing that activity. Now you could say, well, does this really happen? Happens all the time. One of the key contributors to the voltage effect is we roll out programs well before there is true evidence and convincing evidence that it works. And DARE is a perfect example. A lot of you are too young to know this, but. There was a program that one of the best first ladies in the, in the mid 80s, this is Nancy Reagan, one of the smartest and best first ladies, maybe after Hillary Clinton, who, who was super smart, um, was she wanted to take on the drug epidemic amongst teens across America. Same thing's going on right now with the opioid crisis in, in the past several years in America. And her program was called the Drug Abuse Resistance Education Program. It was an education program that they went to public schools all around the states. In fact, they came to my public school. And I remember sitting there hearing the Just Say No campaign. And I looked at my teacher and I said, look, I don't use drugs, but I have a lot of friends who use drugs. And there's no way this is going to work. No way. And the teacher said, you know what? Might be true, but they say that there's a lot of data behind it. As it turned out, there was. It was a really good study from Honolulu that had like 1,700 kids in the Just Say No education campaign. And those initial data did say it worked. But the problem is, is when you went back, and tried it again and again, didn't work and didn't work. And it also didn't work anywhere else. So we spent millions and millions of dollars, millions and millions of people hours pushing something that Nancy Reagan has a great, had a great heart. And she was trying to do well by her country, but she was pushing something that inherently had no voltage from the very beginning. And that was a just say no campaign. And the literature and policymaking circles are replete with examples like this. Now, the way I want you to think about it in an ocular sense is, okay, you have, let's say, a benefit cost profile in the small scale. You have the inference problem. And then it goes to a much smaller benefit profile in the small or large scale. Now I say small or large scale because it's a false positive. So here, of course, you're scaling something that should have never been scaled in the first place. In the book, I talk about another kind of false positive. You know, I've been talking about the, the non-nefarious false positive so far, but you also have dupers. You can think about Elizabeth Holmes who right now is in a trial with uh, her company Theranos, which is basically a duper. 
you can think about in academic circles. In the book, I talk a lot about Brian Wansink, who was at Cornell and has now withdrawn dozens and dozens of papers because of the essence of some type of fraud in many of those papers, okay? Now, whether it's a duper or it's simply alpha, uh, the data line, in each of those cases, a few independent replications can cure them, okay? So that's vital sign number one. Vital sign number two in economies is representativeness of the population. In um, standard language, it's basically know your audience. Um, know who your audience is. And in your initial and secondary data collection, make sure you understand your audience. Now, what I'm talking about here is what I refer to as horizontal scaling or spread. Some people call this external validity as well. The idea is, do your results apply to others? So, so think about Check. Check works brilliantly for Chicago Heights kids and their families. Well, what about others? What about different socioeconomic status families? What about different racial groupings? What about different backgrounds? All of that might matter. Now, in our schematic, after you show that check is not a false positive, try it in California. Same exact program, just a different population. Try it in Denver. Now, you go across cities to think about horizontally scaling or spreading it. And in that way, you make sure to understand the result work for Chicago Heights families does it spread to other types of communities who might be very different a very different kind of audience or a very different kind of population. Now you can say, well, is this really true? Does, can this possibly happen? The literature is replete with examples like this. And think about an anemia um, example from India. So, so anemia is a very, very serious illness. It's, it's very broad. It affects about 1.6 billion people worldwide. Now, the conjecture is, is that iron deficiency is one of the leading causes of anemia. So very early on, some small scale field experiments showed that double fortified salt could really help. And it helped in particular for young females. Double fortified salt means salt fortified with iron and iodine. Now, surprisingly, in 2012, India did a nationwide scale up just on the basis of the evidence from young females. And you can guess what happened. It was a big flop that had basically an average treatment effect of zero because they applied it to the entire population. Still worked for young females, but it doesn't work for anyone else. So if you know your population and know your audience from the very beginning, you never want to scale something that does not have efficacy broadly. You can scale it to that group of people. It doesn't make sense to scale it to somebody else. You should find a solution that works for that other set of people, okay? And I could have used any number of examples on the, on the population side. So the schematic that I think of here is again in the Petri dish, you have a benefit cost profile, you might have a change in population, and again, you have a benefit drop. Now, in, in our models, what we show is that all you need is individual heterogeneities. And then if people select the into programs, the people who are gonna line up first for your experiment, are the people who expect to get the largest impact from the program. So this isn't anything about a nefarious scientist cherry picking. This is simply about a scientist who wants to maximize experimental power. So if you wanna maximize your sample size subject to a fixed budget constraint, the people who will demand the lowest payment are the ones who are gonna have the largest treatment effect. 
So if you don't understand that that was a select group from the beginning, a select group who comes into your research study, the, the scientist will unwittingly give us an estimate that for sure will have a voltage drop. Now, of course, also in the model is the scientist who might know something about people. In, in our model, the scientist has a dual objective function, which is one, create results that are replicable, and two, create results so I get a large treatment effect estimate. And then the scientist chooses the weights to put on those two factors in their objective function. And all you need is a non-zero weight on getting a big publication and having a big treatment effect, and you're gonna get a voltage drop ju just by having a non-zero weight on that term, okay? So whether it's out of being nefarious or not, both of those lead to a benefit drop and a voltage effect. Third vital sign. And again, in economies, I call this a representativeness of the situation. And here, essentially, what I'm talking about is, is it the chef or is it the ingredients? That's the running example I use in this chapter in the book. So what I mean by that is, when you look at restaurants that have scaled effectively, they tend to be scaling something like the ingredients, which are replicable at scale. And the restaurants that typically fail to scale are the ones where the secret sauce was the chef or the secret sauce was the brick oven that you can't reproduce in a different setting. So it's understanding what is the secret sauce and then deciding, can we replicate that situation at scale? Now, the way I want you to think about this problem is it's horizontal scaling, the spread meets vertical scaling, which is also a spread to different situations, but also within the same market scaling up, okay? And what I mean by that is when you're in the same input market, there might be different infrastructural constraints that you have at scale that you didn't have in the Petri dish. You might have to worry about, do our administrators buy in? And as I'll talk about in the next slide, if you report the mechanisms or the, mediated, the me mediation paths for why something works, administrators buy in more often. Now thinking about check, I hired 30 teachers for check. If I want to have check all around Chicago, I might have to hire 30,000 teachers. If the secret sauce behind check is it has to have a great teacher, good luck. Because I'm not going to be able to find 30,000 great teachers for the same budget that I hired 30. In fact, I probably won't even be able to find 30,000 great teachers. So that's super important when you're in the same input market to understand, are there going to be problems with replicating the non-negotiables in your program when I scale that up? That's part of the situation. Now, I want to unpack the situation even more because this is really the richest vital sign of the, of the five. Uh, John, so I want quickly, to um, go ahead. Yeah. Another question from Anthony, can including control variables that represent the major differences between the subsample and the population address the problem? Uh, I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. So um, in, a, in, in three or so slides, if I don't get to that appropriately, please ask the question again, okay? Okay. So what I wanna talk about now are four key results and then dig a little bit deeper here. So as I mentioned, what's really interesting in the literature is there is a fidelity problem in many cases. When you scale something up, there tends to be a lot of times a political will problem or a problem that administrators just don't know how to or, or what they should be 
scaling and what the program should look like. In just about every case, if you can show the facilitators why something is working, this is what we talk about when we say mechanisms, you know, know the mechanisms or what the psychologists talk about when they say mediation paths. If you can show them the whys behind something, they're much more faithful to your program. Secondly, use humans don't scale. Uh, use technology whenever you can. That will do a few things for you. It will give you the correct dosage or correct program at scale. It will allow you to standardize. Those programs that use technologies are much more scalable typically than the programs that rely on humans. Third, you very rarely hear the interaction between policymakers and researchers. When policymakers say, just tell me the non-negotiables, tell me what needs to be in place. When we scale up this program, policymakers on this call, you should demand to know what are the non-negotiables and what are the negotiables in any idea. And the scientists should be able to tell you that. I think one thing that's very rarely done that needs to be done more is that the original scientist who produces the idea or, and or the replicating scientists, they should be part of the implementation team. When, when you take this thing to scale, why not have alongside an academic partner? Typically what happens is an academic writes the paper, and, and really in many cases, it's an efficacy test, but they don't advertise it as an efficacy test. They write the paper, get it published, and move on to their next idea. They should be along for the ride of scaling. Now, this is a, a slide that is stolen, as you can see, from David Helpern, and, and this is a good reason why. I, like, I'm a scientist and I've worked with policymakers, um, scientists tend to think about these kinds of things. When I have my science cap on, this is kind of what my brain looks like. When I worked in the White House or when I work in Chicago Heights with local policymakers, this is sort of what I see their brains working like and what I need my brain to work a little bit like this too, because I want to put myself in the shoes of the policymaker. Now, having both of these people, both of these brains, at the table when scaling makes the most sense to me. Okay. Now, now this is where I think the question was going. In many cases, when we talk about individual characteristics, and that was vital sign number two, representativeness of the population. What I say back there is, if you want to know about the populations of people that your idea works for, you of course should block on individual characteristics, do a multi-site trial. Now, let me be clear. I'm not telling you to slow down. I'm telling you at the very inception of your experiment, if you want to scale, you not only want to block on individual characteristics, preferably in a multi-site trial, but you also want to block on situation specific characteristics that you think might be non-negotiables and that you want to explore whether it is a non-negotiable. In check, we hired teachers just like Chicago Heights would hire them because we wanted to make sure we got an average teacher. That was kind of right. What I should have done is I should have sampled some really cruddy teachers, some average teachers, and some super good teachers. And I should have sampled the situation knowing that when I scale, I might have a distribution of teachers and I might then have a good idea about what that non-negotiable, if indeed it is a non-negotiable, whether it will matter at scale. This is what I'm talking about when I say policy-based evidence. It's looking at the constraints or the resource availability that we have at scale in bringing those constraints and resource issues back.
back to the Petri dish, back to Chicago Heights, and exploring, can my idea work with those constraints? It's not an efficacy test anymore, right? It's an honesty test about, I want my idea to change the world. I want to bring the warts of the world back and make sure that it can work with those warts. Now, that's a call to us, the first proposal. The second proposal is a call to policymakers or business people on this call, because I'm growing tired of trying to analyze programs that feel like they're rolled out to give me zero chance to figure out if they work. Think about in 2012, December of 2012, in Australia, you rolled out the plain packaging program for cigarettes. And you did that in a way that makes it nearly impossible for an analyst like me to figure out, does plain packaging work? What I'm saying is I, I, I don't need an experiment, a wholesale experiment when you roll it out. When, when I think about the empirical hierarchy, I do say, if you can roll it out as an experiment, please do it. And then we'll have a really good idea of, did the program just scale? But you can even do it in waves. And doing it in waves will really help the scientists figure out what's happening at scale and what happened during rollout. Okay, so that's my request of policymakers. Just give us a chance when you roll things out. Now, in our schematic, again, we're talking about a benefit cost profile in the small scale. You might have a different situation. And a voltage drop, of course, leads to a smaller benefit profile. And that's what a lot of times we think about the voltage effect is when we go to scale, it's in part implementation issues, but it's, a, it's an entire um, set of, of situational features that I talk about in this particular chapter of the book and in my own work. Now, there is a, a set of uh, papers, a, a meta-analyses that suggest that 30% of the voltage effect is simply because of fidelity. That's why I wanted to unpack fidelity a little bit more for you. Um, important to con consider the non-negotiables, as I mentioned. And in that world, evidence-based policy needs to become policy-based evidence. OK, let me stop there and make sure that I took on that question. If I didn't, I, I want to come back now to that question and, and go ahead. You can, you can rephrase it if I'm being dense. Um, Anthony can't chat. Um, I'll let you know if he writes something or if anyone else writes anything in the Q&A. Sounds good. Yeah. 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 And we can, we can talk about it in the Q&A too. Okay. Okay. So now let's go to vital sign number four. And what this is in the book is understanding spillovers and general equilibrium effects. Okay, so now one of the most, what I think um, surprising spillovers that I've ever seen is this paper that I wrote with Fatima and Eves. And I think Eves is on here, I'm not sure. He, he better be since he's a, a Manish colleague. Um, this is a paper that we titled The Social Side of Human Capital. And for all of you experimentalists on the call, this is a straight out SUTPA violation, right? We, we have four exclusion restrictions that we need in place to make sure that we can identify a causal parameter when we run an experiment. This is really exclusion restriction number one, isn't it, SUTPA? Yes, I'm talking about a straight out SUTPA violation which happened in Czech. And it was amazingly large effect, whereby if you were randomly put in the control group, and if you lived close to other kids who were in the treatment group, if you lived close by enough of them 
our, our estimate and we assume linearity and we make other assumptions. But if you live within a thousand feet of 11 treatment kids, it's like you yourself was in the treatment group. Okay, so now think about that. In the Petri dish, I have massive spillovers from treated kids to control kids. That is sending me a signal that my program is not as effective as it really was, right? Because the control kids are doing too well because of the spillover. Okay, now in this case, of course, when we go from the small scale to the big scale, that B could get larger or smaller. In that example, B is going to get larger, isn't it? Because we have a spillover that crosses the line from treatment to control kids. And if that spillover is positive, then in the Petri dish, we're underestimating the true effect when we scale up. And vice versa, if it's negative, that's when we'd have a voltage drop. Okay, so understanding the spillovers, when, and when I say across lines, what I'm meaning is across groups in the, in the experiment. Now, there are other kinds of spillovers that we also find in our, in our check data, which the, in the paper with uh, Eves and um, Fatima we talk about, and that's something called, that economists call network externalities. So one way to think about this is it's not, I understand that people are very angry at Facebook, so it's probably not a great example, but Facebook, if you only have say five people who use Facebook, it's not gonna be very valuable to the five original people who use Facebook. But when you scale Facebook, what happens is the value of that good or service becomes much, much greater because of network externalities. And as you scale, the value of Facebook, of course, has high voltage at scale. And this is because of treatment to treatment person spillovers, which can happen as well. Okay. So the first half of this um, vital sign is to say, understand spillovers. By design, we try to set up experiments that don't have SUTVA violations. These are two kinds of SUTVA violations, but they're super interesting kinds of SUTVA violations that we need to explore when we're thinking about scaling something. Now, the other half of the vital sign number four is general equilibrium effect. Economists talk about this all the time. Now, step back and think about how we usually do experiments. What we usually do is we go to a population of units or people and we take a sample. And for example, in check, we put some kids in treatment and some kids in control. And then we look at their differences, ceteris paribus. That's typically what we do. And we say the treatment effect is the average outcome difference between those in the program and those in the control. That's our causal parameter of interest. That's not what you want to learn if you want to learn about a program that scales. What you want to know is if every child in society is in treatment versus when no one in society is treated. That's, that's truly what I want to know from the experiment if I'm talking about scale. Now, there are certain cases when you perturb the whole system, that might be very different than when you take out a sample and look at a partial equilibrium effect. This hit home for me when I, I used to be the chief economist at Uber. And in fact, my last talk to this group was what can we learn from Uber? And I stood in front of you all and I talked about three experiments that I had done at Uber. One was on apologies, one was on tipping, and one was on the gender pay gap at Uber. Of course, we ran a lot more experiments. And one of the experiments that we ran 
was that we tried to raise driver wages at Uber by changing the rate card. So what the rate card is, is it tells drivers for every mile that they drive and every minute that they drive, what they will earn. That's how drivers on Lyft and Uber are paid through the per mile and per minute rate card that they sign up for at the beginning. So I was working with the founder, Travis Kalanick, and Travis really wanted to increase driver pay. That's great. So what we did is we went to a market and we took 5% of the drivers out and increased their rate card. And what you found is they were paid more per hour and their labor supply went up. We found a labor supply of like 0.4 for all of, all of you labor economists interested. So that kind of showed that we can increase driver pay through the rate card. So then what happened is you rolled that thing out to 95% of the drivers. What do you think happened in that case? Well, what happened is all those drivers saw that they're going to get paid more. They increased their labor supply. And it effectively undid all of the good stuff that the rate card increase was trying to do because there were a bunch of drivers that were driving around empty and their actual pay per hour did not change at all. And this is a great paper that's written up by John Horton and Jonathan Hall and a few others at Uber that it's a great long run, short run paper that sh effectively shows when you incent all of them in a market, the market comes to a new equilibrium and it entirely undid the good stuff. When you only did 5% of drivers, you weren't able to do that. You weren't able to undo it. Okay, so that kind of gives you an understanding that when GE effects are important, those very first trials might teach us little about what happens at scale. So we always have to understand not only spillovers, but understand the general equilibrium effects that might happen in our experiment. Now, these of course happen outside and then the outside comes back inside and affects people who were part of the experiment. Now, if you don't like the Uber example, you could use my college student example that I oftentimes talk about where, look, if I have 5% of college students randomly becoming econ majors, that's one thing. But if I get 95% of the people across America and make all of them econ majors, good luck. You're not gonna find an econ major premium anymore unless there's a huge demand surge, of course. That's the only way. Otherwise you're gonna undo all the good stuff because there are gonna to be too many econ majors. Okay, that's, a, that's another way you can think about the thought experiment. Okay, the fifth vital sign is something that the scaling literature I've never seen mentioned, but this is exactly where we as economists would probably start. And that's what does a marginal cost function look like? Right? What does the short run supply curve look like? What does the long run supply curve look like? Effectively here, all I'm asking is, are there economies or diseconomies of scale? Let's go to check. Think about what would happen if I said, you know what? I found that one of the secret ingredients or a non-negotiable around the properties of the situation was we need high quality teachers. So when we hire the 30,000 teachers, we need to hire all high quality teachers. What's gonna to happen to the budget? You know it's going to implode and it's gonna give you a very different cost profile if I have to go up the supply curve, which I'm gonna to have to do. I'm gonna to have to increase wages and get the best teachers to say, I'm not gonna to go to Google, I'm gonna become a school teacher. 
I'm not going to go to Wall Street. I'm going to become a school teacher. That's the only way we're going to have to go up the supply curve, or we're going to have to change the, the way that we supply teachers in some fundamental way, which is going to be very costly too. Okay, but the point is, it's a very different cost profile when you're dealing with 30 versus 30,000. Now here, what I'm effectively talking about is not the benefit side, but the cost side. And this is just a simple question about when I scale, am I getting a voltage drop or high voltage because of economies of scale? Now, like I said, I've never seen this in the implementation science literature. In fact, there's no economics in the implementation science literature. That was one thing that I, that I got really excited about is that I had a chance to add economic thought to that literature. We'll, we'll see where that goes. But, but now we're populating that literature with economic models and economic thought. So um, we, we hope that we're bringing new insights to the problem. This is an easy one on the cost side. Now, what we typically don't do is in our own research, I never see people talking about what will the cost side look like and what will the cost profile look like if we had to scale this, never. Never at all, okay? Now, many times this is about vertically scaling, isn't it, in the same input market, but it also might have some traction when you're talking about horizontally scaling as well, okay? So there you have it. Um, those are the five vital signs that once you have those in hand, you will essentially take on 99.99% of the voltage drops that I've seen in the literature. And these also fall out of our theoretical models that we've put forward as well. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about those. And if anyone is interested, these are, these are four of our earlier papers. What I've talked about a lot today is this one work that I folded. Uh, it's titled The Science of Using Science. Th this is where you'll find a, a bunch of the theory. We also have a working paper that is going after a more theorem-based approach, uh, more, let's say, proper theory. And that's, that's just about ready for distribution now. So we'll be sending that out. Uh, the top two papers are very accessible. Uh, the second one here goes to the medical literature and takes learnings from the medical literature, which they, of course, have this problem in spades. Down here, we're lucky enough, there's an entire issue in this journal, the new journal called Behavioral Public Policy, where we start out by asking, how can experiments play a greater role in public policy? 12 proposals from an economic model of scaling. And then there are roughly 10 to 15 comments on our paper from, from all over. Um, sociologists, statisticians, psychologists, economists. So if you wanna see implementation scientists as well, if you wanna see this playing out, that's, that's kind of a, a neat issue that you can, you can start from and go to the ground up. Now, I know I have five minutes left, so I wanna talk a little bit about the back end of the book. Um, we've just gone over the front end of the book, which is detailing if your idea will have voltage drops or not. The last half of the book talks about after you launch an idea or launch a policy, what are kind of four little economic secrets that I see many of the organizations that I've worked with commonly fail. And it starts out in chapter six, it has incentives at scale. So it talks about different pay schemes, uh, different ways we can think about using pecuniary and non-pecuniary um, incentives to try to think about incentives that work in the small and work in the large. Uh, this is something that's old hat to economists, but you know, from all the way back to my days in the White House to my days at Lyft, I talk about those. The level of marginal thinking in organizations is abysmal. And if you just think about it, trimming here and there 
on the margin. And like I say, I talk about one example from the White House, one example from Lyft. You can essentially pick up millions and millions of dollars on the floor. And, and uh, I kind of show how we did that at Lyft. So it's, it's basically marginal thinking. Um, the third one kind of hit near and dear to me. And, and that's uh, a chapter on, you know, I, I was taught that winners never quit and quitters never win. This is a chapter that winners quit. And as humans, we have a bias that we don't quit enough because we tend to neglect opportunity cost. In particular, we neglect opportunity cost of time. So when we're going down a wrong hole, we don't really understand and fully appreciate that every time you dig a little bit deeper, that's one less hole that you might be able to dig that could have more gold or more oil in it. And we're almost conditioned by society not to quit because we read in newspapers, look at that great Olympian, like Ian Thorpe or whoever, who became great. Good thing they didn't quit. They've been at it for 20 years. And now look, they get to get seventh place in the Olympics. Uh, although I, I understand Ian Thorpe didn't. He was, he was like uh, the Thorpedo, right? So the, the wrong name in that example. But you kind of get the point is we celebrate when people don't quit. But the people who don't quit and keep going down the wrong hole, we don't celebrate them. And there are millions and millions of those examples. And Steve Levitt and I uh, designed an experiment that basically shows if you're thinking about quitting something, it's probably too late. You should have quit already um, in, in that you tend to be happier after you quit. And many times people are quitting too late. And then chapter nine is basically uh, riffing on work that I have with another colleague and, and very good friend, Andreas Lebron, who I know is on here. And Andreas did some great work with some villages around Brazil, some fishing villages. And this is, Andreas, you'll like this. This is create your own uh, kabuchu. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. But um, the idea is more or less a pickup from the work with Andreas, along with what I learned at Uber. Uber built a culture that was really good from zero to say 500 million, but it wasn't such a great culture from 500 million to 90 billion. And that ended up being the downfall of Travis. Um, if you read about what happened with Travis Kalanick, one of the big downfalls was because of the culture that, that he ended up uh, creating. And, and I lived through for, for two years at Uber before I moved to Lyft. And this chapter really talks about how to build a culture from the beginning, a culture that is inclusive, a culture that includes equality across not only gender, but race and, and uh, sexual orientation, et cetera. I, I talk about some of my own work there and I talk about work of, uh, of a lot of people on the call here today. So, so that's, that's the, the penultimate chapter. And then the last chapter of course is on, um, is a concluding or the epilogue section. Okay, so now I want to turn back the clock before I start to take questions. And I want to announce the winner of, let me hope my, let's hope my faithful assistant has sent me the winner of this particular game. Let me see. He says he's, I think he's still computing it. Let me, uh, let me tweak him again. Let me see if he texted me. Okay, so I'm going to 
I'm going to stop sharing there, and he's going to send me the two winners, which I will announce sometime during the Q&A. So it's going to keep people around a little bit, Erta. Um, and then I'll uh, and then I'll take questions and announce the the winner. Yeah, so I'll, I'll stop sharing. And uh, thanks so much for everyone's attention. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk, John. Uh, so now we are open to a Q&A discussion. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you are the attendees. We'll just allow you to join the conversation uh, if you raise your hand. Or if you prefer, please feel free to type your question in the chat box and we'll read that for you. Uh, let's see. Uh, so let's start. I know Pushka typed some question early on. So maybe a Pushka, then Emma. And uh, we also have uh, some questions uh, from the other participants. John, very interesting. Yeah. I, Thank you, you know, Pushkar. I, looking, I, I was, when I, you know, when talking about the policy based evidence part of, I think, the vital science three in, in mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. to me, it seemed as if you're talking about heterogeneous treatment effects done correctly, where you actually randomize across groups and so on. Am I thinking of it? That's, I'd say that's too, Pushkar. So I think that heterogeneity, we typically talk about what, what I call a Kate, a conditional average treatment effect. Yeah. So, so usually in an experiment, we, we estimate the average treatment effect. If you want to talk about heterogeneity, we usually talk about it on some predetermined covariate yeah, yeah. vector. That would be a conditional average treatment effect. That would be um, bin number two. Okay. Um, now, to go to three, um, you're essentially doing conditional average treatment effects across situations. So, one example could be poor teachers versus great teachers. Right. And I'm I'm estimating that is essentially a moderator. Um, it's a causal moderator in the sense that I can randomize good and bad teachers, and then that will moderate my treatment effect. So you're, you're right to say heterogeneity is in bin two. Heterogeneity is also in bin three, but it's heterogeneity along different dimensions no. that are that are moderators of the treatment effect that I'm measuring. That's the way I, I want you to think about it, Pushkar, okay? Yeah. Now, both of those, let's be clear now, both of those can be explored in the original design with some kind of backward induction, right? Because you say, look, if I wanna scale this thing with teachers, I know I'm gonna have really bad teachers, so I wanna make sure to explore different kinds of teachers. If I, want to exp if I want to roll this thing out, I might have different kinds of kids or different kinds of families, whether it's age or, or race or SES grouping, whatever. So you know what? I probably want to do that early on. Right. And if it's not in the first step, I, I don't mind researchers doing an efficacy test to start. So what I mean by that is give theory or give your program its best shot. Right. That's fine, but then don't forget that it was an efficacy test. What I see a lot of times is people do an efficacy test, and then when they report it and talk about it, they forgot suddenly that it was an efficacy test. And then that's the tricky part, because then a policymaker or some such views it kind of like in the medical world, they figured it out. The first, the first run is an efficacy test, then you have phase one phase two, phase three. And when you pass all those, we got a viable product and we have a safe product and we have uh, something that has safety and efficacy. Right. And they don't always do this. Because they're not very good at heterogeneity or as good as they should be, or they're not at all that good at mediation paths. But what sometimes they also do is they figure out which groups it works for. And that's like extent of market because Pfizer will make them do that. Or, or at Lyft, we do that. We, we figure out, is this worth it? Or does it just work in Seattle? That, that's the kind of heterogeneity that a lot of firms will do. A lot of policymakers, you saw, you know this. They, they roll it out because they say, we just can't wait. Mm. We, we think that this works. And a lot of policymakers also have different objective functions than we do. In, in many cases, like Kartik has a nice paper that shows in India 
a lot of their objective functions just on inputs. Uh, Indian policymakers just want to show that they're busy. And um, uh, David Yang has a great paper in China that his provinces are our people. So I was just talking to him. I'm, I'm visiting Harvard for the year. I was just talking to him about the, the, the scaling theory. And he's like, oh, I got this working paper. Oh my God, everything that's in there is exactly what provinces in China are doing. And they have a huge selection problem. It, it tends to be both in bin two and bin three. And then they put it up to the federal government and then it never works. Or, or it's a huge voltage drop because of really it's all bin two and bin three. And um, so he's, he's now writing that part along those lines, but, but you see this ubiquitously. And it, Simon, you saw this probably too, although they're better. It happens in firms too. Mm -hmm. So firms aren't perfect, but it tends that they don't get evaluated on inputs in firms. They get evaluated on outputs. So a lot of times they have the political will problem and uh, the objective function problem that governments mess up all the time, the political economy problem. Firms don't always have that completely figured out, but they have it better figured out than what uh, governments have, at least in, in what I've seen. Okay, I'll stop there. I hope that helped, Pushkar. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, super. Um, Anmol is next on the list for questions. Super. I have, I have three questions. First is if Ronald Coase was around, would you pay him to buy your book or uh, would he pay you to buy your book? He would pay me quadruple to okay. buy the book. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and look, one of my first seminars at Chicago, Ron was in the audience. Okay. Uh, it wasn't the very first one. The very first one, Gary Becker was in there and he checked himself out of the hospital and was wearing a hospital gown, had a plugged IV. Once I saw that, I fell in love with Chicago economics. But Ron was in like the second or third one, and he had this really big bullhorn because he had a he was like 101, yeah. and he really couldn't hear very well, but he was sharp as a tack. Uh, but I think Ron would pay triple, and he would even pay the the boat to to um, take a trip across the ocean and deliver it to the land down under. Okay. Uh, this second is. I, um, I want to know what you think about this underlying issue of the architecture of incentives, because yeah. when you really talk about the uh, failure of, um, you know, certain effect being observed because, you know, certain uh, non-negotiables um, uh, could not be, you know, uh, found or could not be motivated to perform in that way. Um, I don't know. I mean, it seems like Somewhere along the line, the chain of incentives, eliciting the right people, gorging their intrinsic motivations is something that we need to be careful about. Um, and then the third, maybe third question is perhaps related as well. Um, do we also need to worry about, uh, you know, the participant themselves being aware of the externalities uh, that are created as a result of them undertaking a certain type of effort. For example, in the case of the drug use policy, you know, saying no in general does not hurt me. You know, it, it benefits others, right? But in the other case where majority of the students end up taking economics major, I know for sure that I'm contributing to the fact that competition is going to rise in some way or the other. So, does the information to the participant of, are they, I mean, would it, would it matter if they were to be made aware of these direct and indirect externalities as well that will be produced as a result of certain things happening? Yeah, so, so to take on your, your last question first, if you really, if they really did know the truth about the marginal impact of just one person, then they all won't, it won't matter, right? because it's zero. It's like, it's like the, um, the probability of being a pivotal voter is zero. So if that's truly why you're voting, then you shouldn't vote if you understood the truth. Yeah. So, so if you told, most people overestimate yeah. the, the effect that they have on a system. That, that's just a fact. People tend to 
overestimate uh, ubiquitously. So if you told them the truth, then I, I, I don't think that they would take account of externalities just like they should, because on the margin, they're zero. Um, your second question, I think, is important in that most people don't recognize when you talk to them that every choice setting has an architecture. And because they always think, oh, it's neutral, et cetera, et cetera. No, every choice setting has some architecture. And in markets, the person with market power tends to be the designer of the architecture. Yeah. That, that tends to be one thing that's not appreciated is that if you have market power, you tend to also have power over the architecture. I think when talking about scaling, you're exactly right. You, you want to make sure that any feature that through your theory or the empirical evidence would suggest is important, you want to at least consider that dial in the Petri dish. Now, I'm not saying you need a million different things. Let's say, like in the paper that I wrote with Levitt, we took a stand on what, what we care about with measuring social preferences in the lab. And we laid out four things that we cared about, right? Uh, norms, um, selection, whether you're being observed, and, and wealth. And, and we said, look, those are going to be the four things that we stand on. That's going to be our theory. And we're going to measure if those things matter. And now at least you have you don't have this cursive dimensionality where you never get anywhere. So you, you almost want to write down a simple theory and then say, within my model, these things should matter. So then I want to explore those things in the original design. And those are things that I think are going to matter when we scale. A lot of times it's going to be revolved around some predetermined vector of characteristics, X is probably, that's going to be bin two. Bin three is going to depend on the situation. You know, if it's something that goes against the norm, it's going to matter if you're being observed. If it's going to be something that is purely prices and purely transactional, then some of that stuff won't matter as much as a reputational concern might. Like in my 2006 behavioral goes to the market type paper, but you kind of get the point. It's sort of the the situational features I want to explore and I want people to explore are the ones that I think are going to matter when you roll this thing out and ones that I can also test for in my original design. I don't hear people talking about that. I oftentimes hear people generalizing across a population of people and situations, and they typically only do any data around the first one. Now, that's where that's where Pushkar went. Is the first one is uh, it's heterogeneity. It's it's uh, predetermined X's. Yeah, that's one thing. But what about the predetermined situational features that I know matter, like teacher quality, or or size of the pill, whatever it is, right? Size of the pill might matter because in in medication adherence, they might people might take the horse pills less than if it was a quarter of the size. That's what we found when we were working with Humana. So if you want to scale a medicine, you need to take account of the cost of ingestion and the cost of reminding them, et cetera. You, you kind of get the point, but you're exactly right. But I think that's driven by theory and some empirical evidence. And a lot of times that gives us a good guide to start. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for your question. Uh, John, our next question has been written in by Roger Spence and Roger asks, can you maybe talk through an example of a fully scaled treatment that has high voltage, i.e. a policy intervention that works really well at full scale? Yeah, I think the polio vaccinations, what happened when Salk, um, it's kind of perfect because, so Jonas Salk starts by doing some experiments on his own kids. And um, it's kind of interesting a lot. I, I thought that I was unique in doing that with my own kids you know, trying to get my oldest daughter to use the toilet and doing some incentives and some within-person incentives, et cetera. But the medical scientists are 
in some cases notorious, but in other cases uh, famously use their kids. So Salk uses his kids, finds efficacy. He then does this um, pretty large scale experiment with other kids along the lines of the a polio vaccination. And what he finds is pretty much works for, it's not a false positive. So check off bin number one. Number two, wow, it really works for every kid. Now bin number three is, but how am I gonna deliver that vaccination? Because it's really hard to think about the delivery. I, I know that once they get it in their arms, they're not gonna develop polio and then they're not gonna be able to transmit it. I learned that from one and two, but now I need to figure out a way to get it in everyone's arms. They leverage the healthcare system. And that's what we do a really good job with MMR where it's, look, you have to come in at six months and 12 months and 18 months and two years. You get your whole vaccination program given to you when you have a baby. Wow, that's pretty good because now I'm gonna be able to get it in their arms. I've, I've solved the situation. I've just talked about spillovers, right? You have really high spillovers because you, you can no longer transmit it. And then of course, at the end, there are great economies of scale. Why? Because like most drugs, a big expense is R&D. So you spend a lot of money developing and to create each level or each dosage, it's really tiny right? Really, really tiny. So you can now envision the average total cost curve going down, keeps going down, down, down. And there you go. We have the delivery. Now, a lot of times you'd say, well, the, the, the cost is not going to be prohibitive in the production. It's going to be delivery. But we had that figured out with the um, healthcare system. Okay. So I hope that's a good example in my mind, it's almost a perfect example that checks every box and it shows you, wow, that's high voltage at scale. Now, typically in the medicines, it comes down to adherence a lot of times. And it also comes down to it works for some and not others. And then the delivery becomes in, but, but that's an example where, where we hit on all cylinders. Look, and I talk about the the pandemic, and I talk a little bit about the mistakes. There, there's no doubt that the president made a lot of mistakes, um, up and down. So that that's a learning lesson. But there are really good models for how it worked. I hope I hope that one works for the question for Mr. Spence. I, um, the next question comes from Kong Fam. Kong, I'm adding you to the conversation. Um, so you can ask John your question now. Uh, Kong, can you hear us? Okay, I might move to the next question. Maybe you can just read the question and if you Kong can, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah Kong, Kong actually wrote his question in the Q&A as well. He said, if possible, um, I'd like to ask a question. What is about research topics not on experimental economics? Are there determinants of the voltage effect that are different? Uh, ben, can you recast that question? I don't think um, I totally uh, understand. Yeah, I might try and <laughs> I read that verbatim, but so what about research topics that aren't specifically experimental economics? Uh, the determinants of the voltage effect that differ for the oh, oh yeah 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 so so I don't think that anything that I've talked about is limited to experimental economics and what I mean by that is let's just say that okay so let's, let's be clear about what experimental economics gives us experimental economics gives us an understanding and control of the assignment mechanism and that is very powerful because now I've essentially solved the selection problem. 
I can randomize people into treatment and control because I, I control the assignment mechanism. Other approaches, think about natural experiments. A great Nobel Prize given to uh, Josh Angris, David Card, and Hito uh, Imbens on approaches when you don't know the assignment mechanism. And, and they made famous, many of them did great work up and down, but they made famous natural experiments. Natural experiments uh, are when nature controls the assignment mechanism. And then we try to make inference from that. So we use naturally occurring data. You can think about regression discontinuity. You can think about IV. You can think about propensity score matching. You can think about structural. All of these are approaches to generate counterfactuals to learn something that's causal. When you do that, you have a data set from a group of people and a situation that you also need to understand. Can I generalize that horizontally and vertically to say the exact same thing that the treatment effect, the schooling or whatever, you know, Josh's paper on the value of schooling or the returns to schooling, can I generalize across his group to a lot of other groups and situations? It's whole cloth, identical to what I just explained. I put it in um, experimental language because that's what I do. I, I, I do field experiments and lab experiments. But, but all of these insights generalize to naturally occurring data as well. The next question has been written in by Rita and Rita asks, how do you factor in the unknowns, personal preferences, competing priorities, political priorities, changes in economic environment, et cetera? Yeah, so, so the unknowns and uncertainty in our model tends to come in two places. The, the first place is, is that you have a bunch of researchers who are competing and because of that, I want you to think of this as like a winner's curse problem. So a bunch of people are getting a treatment effect estimate along with a, a random shock. So the one that tends to win is the one likely that got the highest random shock. So that, that's like the winner's curse phenomenon. That's kind of one way why we might have false positives. Now, on the, on the uh, politician or practitioner side, we, we talk about that, but we never formally model the political economy aspect of the problem. And I think that, to my mind, that's the next step in this research agenda, is to try to take seriously the behavioral biases and the political economy problem, which of course, that's a huge literature. What I focused on is the knowledge creation market. I could have easily focused on how do we incentivize donors to give money to researchers? That's chain link one. Link two is the knowledge creation market or the scientific market. And then link three is the political economy of how do we get policymakers to enact the policies that they should enact? You know, we put together a model that says median voter model or a rent seeking model. You know, I've written papers on um, when, you, when you are term limited. You know, how do term limited people do in relation to non-term limited people? That's a paper that I wrote with Daniel Sturm. So all of this political economy aspect is extremely important, but we don't have anything original to add to that because we have not taken on that problem. Now, let me be clear. That's not because it's unimportant. Political will in any organization and in any governmental agency in particular is extremely important. A lot of times you have a program going up and then the administrators don't want to do it. They don't believe in it or they, they're vested in, in the program. That's one reason why I said you want the original scientist on board because they can at least hold a little bit their feet to the coals and make sure that they're actually implementing the right program. Otherwise, nearly every time, and this happens in the business world too, you get people undoing the good stuff because either they don't believe it, they don't know how to do it, they don't understand it. But that, that is a serious problem, no doubt. 
Okay, Leo, um, I think you've got the next question. Hey, Leo, how are you doing? Hi. Uh, hey, hi, nice John. To see you. Uh, it's so nice to see you again. Really nice miss you a lot. Yeah, yeah I we'll miss you back here. You in person soon. So Very I'm good. really excited to uh, learn the external validity of all the experiments. And however, I find sometimes it's uh, difficult to kind of getting things replicated in the field. Uh, for example, I have uh, some uh, lab experiments which I believe, uh, well, I, I was testing some uh, kind of mechanism which I believe can deter crime in the real world. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, I find it's really hard to kind of bring this lab experiment to the real world. And also as a follow-up question, uh, do you have uh, some suggestions for junior scholars like me? who have uh, limited resources to kind of getting things uh, done in many places and testing kind of uh, repl yeah. replications. Yeah, no, no, great. Um, Leo, excellent. Let, let me take on the first one because when you look at lab and field, for example, and you think about replication, there are many ways to define replication. So when Levitt and I wrote about replication, we said, look, the first kind of replication is you get the person's data and you try to replicate their results. You can do that easily in lab and field. Um, the second case is that you go to the same setting and you try to replicate the results. That's where the lab is beautiful, right? A um, little tricky because if Lata wants to replicate my results, she really, to be fair, she should really be flying to Chicago and using my same population. That, that, that's the way that you test for a false positive. We, we tend to say replicate when we go across populations, but stay in the student space, but go across to a different student group. That All that said, it's just a lot easier to do stuff like that in the lab and check one another's work in the lab than it is to do my check experiment, right? It's, an, it's impossible for somebody to go and get $20 million and run a four-year check experiment. That, that's a shortcoming of, of like an, many field experiments, not, not artifactual field experiments, but it's a shortcoming of, that was a frame field experiment, but it would also be hard for a lot of you to replicate the large natural field experiments I do at Lyft. It, they can replicate it internally easily, but, but harder for an external group. What, what I say there is, it, that's exactly true, I think, but what I say is that we should take the pieces of check out and try to replicate those, the ones that we can. And because otherwise, if you sit around waiting for people to replicate check, it might happen within a hundred years. And then the check program is never going to get scaled. I've just undid my own good, good program, right? So I think there we need to do multi-site trials and quickly get insights on pieces of the program to make sure that the pieces are working. And then, and then within like six months or a year, you can scale that up. Now, now you're right to say, when I have something cool in the lab, a lot of times it's hard to find natural field parallels. Now, that was one reason why when Glenn and I wrote that 2004 JEL paper that we said, look, a lot of times the first step is just to get a sample pool that you think might be more natural than students. Like for example, if I'm doing an experiment on uh, the Chicago Board of Trade traders. It, it might make sense to start with students, but then if I want to do an artifactual field experiment, go and get some traders and bring them into the lab. I don't think that that is extraordinarily expensive or extraordinarily difficult to do if you're doing farmers or entrepreneurs or whatever. I, I think a lot of times we can find a non-standard subject pool where it gets harder I think is finding like a natural field experiment and the ability to do that. I don't think you're always gonna be able to do that in part because a lot of our lab experiments, we're making up institutions 
people who are making up, um, let's say, a margin that no one would ever find themselves on, let, let me caution you. I think those are the hardest ones to generalize as well. But we tend to do that to test a theory. We put people on an artificial margin that they're never going to find themselves on in the real world. But we do it to, to uniquely test a theory. The lab's good at that because it allows us to create an artificial situation that the real world doesn't. So in a way, you've created a setting that you can never try to do in, as a natural field experiment by definition. OK, now your last question is the hardest one. When I started doing field experiments in the late 80s and early 90s, I was doing them as a, a baseball card dealer, as you know. And I would go there, and I didn't have any research money, but I would use my baseball card collection to fund my experiments. So the first formal kind of scientific experiment I did was probably like in 92, when I went to a baseball card show, and I used as subject payments baseball cards that I had collected in the 70s and 80s. And, uh, and I had gotten as a dealer in the, in the uh, late 80s as an undergrad doing experiments. So I would say if you can find settings like MTurk, like David, David Riley did some cool experiments on eBay bidding, and doing things like that that are lower cost but allow you to get to the field where you have a natural setting where people have selected in and you're overlaying randomization on that realism. I, I think that there are those opportunities out there and then you can kind of plow your own field. Now, the other part is to work with a, a rich co-author like Andreas, your advisor, who has all kinds of opportunities in the world of gender and inclusiveness which you're doing, of course, and you work with other people and, and they help you out. Um, I think that younger people in general don't work with enough different people early enough. So one of my, I, I made a lot of mistakes in my life. One thing that wasn't a mistake is I worked with a lot of senior people who were very different from each other not to bring in resources, but just I could learn how they thought about the economic science and how they thought about using a model, using data, generating data, how they crafted papers, how they thought about how their work fits in. I, I think young people don't sample enough different people than, than they, they typically do. And that's one thing that I'm really happy. You, you need good senior people to be kind enough to work with you. Of course, I, I totally get that. But but they're out there. Um, and I think you'll find you're smart. You, you'll, you'll find that they'll they think you're smart, too. And then you'll have you'll have colleagues. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you. Thanks, Leo, for your questions. Um, Erta, do we have time for more questions or? Yeah, we're actually out of time, but if John's available, maybe we take last question. Yeah, sure. I would, I'll, I'll, look, I'll stay here as long as you want me. Okay, um, <laughs> Simon, you've written a question. I've allowed you to talk if you want to ask it. If not, then um, I'll read it out. Hi. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. You can hear me now. Okay, great. <laughs> Simon, you look like you're from the, the, the Netherlands. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yep. I can tell by your surname. Anything that has a Vaughn in it, I say, uh, unless it's a Von Trapp family, which is one of my favorite musicals, of course, they're from Austria, but uh, this is a Von Ball family. Right, tourist. that's true. <laughs> well, they have migrated a lot over the world, so you might encounter them in the U.S. Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, so my question was whether we could apply these um, uh, these learnings that you had about scaling experiments to uh, how funding, scientific funding is structured. Because you often get like these small grants that let you explore new things. But I don't think that the scientists are properly incentivized to kind of scale up uh, uh, what, what they find. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think you're, Simon, you're exactly right. 100% right. Um, when I talk to people like John Arnold, 
who is a philanthropist from Houston here in the States, who is really into scaling and changing the world through ideas. And I talked to, you know, organizations like CASE. So CASE is an organization that is really trying to push science and philanthropy. And, and each time I talk to a person who has the purse strings, I tell them the only way we are going to change the culture around this problem, which I think of it more broadly as a culture around replication, a culture around generalizability, a culture around scaling. I think of scaling as a, an important piece of generalizability. It, it's an extremely important piece, but generalizability is a broader tent. Um, I tell them that you know, as a journal editor, I'm, I'm starting a new journal called the Journal of Political Economy Micro. And that's going to be a sister journal to the JPE. And every issue, I want a replication paper in there because I'm tired of people saying replication is important in economics, but let's, let's have somebody else, <laughs> some other journal do it. Uh, but, but it's important. I, I, I can't sit here in good faith. Look, Bob Slonim did a great job with JSA, Journal of the Economic Science Association, and that helps. But, but we need more general interest journals jumping in and taking it seriously. Because the problem right now is, you know, you try to replicate someone's work and you've earned two things. One, you've earned an enemy because a person hates you and because they feel violated. And two, you've earned a paper that, if you're lucky, is published in the Journal of Last Resort. It's like, who wants to do that? Um, so journal editor Simon can help. But, but I think, ultimately, it, you know, it's part also people like Simon saying, look, I'm the dean, or, or I don't know if Mike's on here. I'm the chair. And I'm going to give some credibility to, to replication. You know, it's not as severe as in you know, in the medical sciences, when you, the first discovery gets placed in science and the second and third also get publications in science or in nature, there's a lot of incentive there. And, and, and people get tenure and, and um, promoted and they also get um, uh, grant funding. But now it's Simon to come all the way around. I, I tell my colleagues who hold the purse strings, we can do that is an academic, and I promise to do that. I'm doing that with the JPE Micro, but that's not enough. It, it's gonna take everyone pushing, and ultimately it's gonna come down to the people who hold the resources, NSF, private philanthropists, people who are giving money for research, they have to demand you have a piece that's gonna be about scaling. I want you to say, you're not only testing this theory, you're finding mechanisms, great. You can go out and get your AER now or your JPE now, but you also have to detail the, the negotiables and non-negotiables. You have to look at some constraints that are gonna happen at scale and you have to detail those in your academic paper and in the report that you send back to us. Yes, the only way that we're gonna get everyone pulling on the same rope because the incentives just are not strong enough right now for people to look at my scaling five, five vital signs. They, they might do it if they send it to the JPE because they know I'm gonna handle it or they might do it if they think I'm gonna be a referee. But, but that ends up being such a small group of people. We, we need those funders also. And, and some of them are bought in, the true believers are but it needs to be pushed more broadly. So Simon, that was a long response, but I hope yeah. you, you get the sense that I appreciate your question because it's a good one. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you for your talk. Uh, yeah, very enlightening. Thank you. Can Thanks, I, if, John, can I also mention that at Experimental Economics, we are also encouraging people to cite replications. So that's another awesome. incentive. That's, yes. So when you, when you talk yes. about the original paper and discuss that in your paper, then also cite the replications of, oh, I love that. with uh, those papers. So at least it increases citations of those replications. Yeah, papers. no, that, that's, look, look uh, Lata, that's brilliant. 
you know, what, what we have in that science of using science paper is we have things like, if your results are replicated, you should get credit. Like all, all the time now, we, when, when somebody, like it used to be the Glenn Harrison effect, right? So Glenn is, a, is an Aussie who I've worked with a lot. And like back in the 90s and early 2000s, whenever you had a paper in a major journal, it's almost like Glenn knew it. And Glenn would send you an email asking for your data even before the ink was dry. And I think that people got nervous because of what happened with the flat payoff stuff with Glenn and Vernon Smith and Kevin McKay back in the early 90s, that, that people took it as like a challenge and uh, a, a way to be negative. I think if your work is replicated, you, des you deserve credit and, and to be shown that you have work that rep, because all, look, the, the, the title of that Mattyitis paper to start was all empirical results published in top journals are wrong. Mm. And, and it was titled that because of that first slide I showed you. If Look, to get in the top journal, it has to be a surprise, right? That's what all the editors say. It's not surprising enough. He's not going to get in here. Well, if it's a surprise, it's probably wrong. <laughs> I showed you that if a surprise is like, oh, I only put a 1% chance that that's being real. Okay, after you have the first data set, it has a 2% chance. It's still wrong probably, right? But uh, the editor of that, of that paper was um, Larry Samuelson. And he said, John, I, I really think it's too inflammatory. You, you need to change it. And that's why we change it to one swallow doesn't make a summer. Because you know, a lot of times, most of these results are probably wrong. But, but we don't understand and appreciate that. But, but when they are replicated, the original scientist should get kudos and credit because then that will force us to put more weight on that replication component in our theory. And, and I think people should be celebrated who replicate. That's why I really love, Lata, your, your, um, your push to say, look, cite the original, but then cite the replication too. That's important, absolutely. Can I just add on that? I wonder, given your, your talk, you talk about how the failure of scale up, what we actually can learn from that. And I wonder whether we actually can learn from the failure of replication, right? Like you said, maybe it's because we learned teachers matters, which we have not taken into account when we just do our small study. So I wonder whether we could actually encourage people to report more failure of replication and try to understand, not just to stop in there, understand 100%. what is the cause of that. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, look, when you think about the file drawer problem and p-hacking and how that comes together in our reporting, look, I think it was a good try, the registry, but if any of you have read my paper on the registry, it's it's been abysmal, let's be honest. Um, when you allow people to register right after they get their paper accepted, come on, you're not, you're not being serious about, about solving the file drawer problem or p-hacking or false positives. Um, so we, we looked at all the data in our registry and also in a GovDoc registry and all the registries, they're all failing. They're, they're, they are all over-promising and under-delivering. And it's because very few people, one, register on time, two, and, and what I mean by on time is before you collect any data at all, two, they register such a scant amount of information that even when they do register early, outcomes aren't clearly defined, treatments aren't clearly defined, how you're going to look at the data is not clearly defined. Look, it's all spelled out in this paper that I that I wrote with two colleagues that no no editor will take, by the way. So it gets rejected all over the place. Um, and, and it's about pre-registration. I think we need to do better. And um, it's the way it happened. Look, I think it's a step in the right direction, but now the next step is going to be the hardest. The easiest one is just create a registry like every other area has. The hardest part is getting the registry to work the way that we want it to work. That's super hard, but you, you can see how it's just failing miserably. Like less than 5% of, of papers that claim to be pre-registered actually do it in a proper way. And, and you'll see how I define proper in that paper.
Mm. Um, but anyway, so you can tell them a little bit passionate about turning economics into a science, or at least let's continue economics as a science. Great. Everything takes time, I guess. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so I think we're way out of time. Thank you so much for your time, John. Thanks for a very uh, insightful uh, talk. And uh, thanks everyone who are still staying with us, participating in this uh, lecture. Um, we are, oh, uh, should I give you time to announce the winner? Or? Yeah, let me see. I don't. Okay, so I'm, what I'm going to do, Erta, is I'm going to send you the two names. Okay. For some reason, Oh my God, here's what he literally said. He had a date and it went better than expected. So he will give them to you tomorrow. Okay, no problem. That's literally what he said. <laughs> that works. I'm not kidding you. We are all very patient. <laughs> I'm not patient. That's literally what he said. This is crazy. At least he's being honest. <laughs> no, but just tell me up front that you're gonna go on a date. <laughs> I, can, I I have a pretty big Leo. I have a pretty big team, right? Well, we have a very different uh, life goal than <laughs> not academic yeah, people. <laughs> um, uh, so, so Erica, I will I will send you those two names, and then I want, and then we're going to email the two winners, and then they can have whatever inscription that they want. Okay, but okay. it can't. I don't want it political or uh, naughty. It should. It could be things like. Um, Let's say Stephanie Fisher wins. It could be Stephanie, you're the greatest economist I've ever met. Uh, <laughs> may the voltage be with you, John List. I have no problem with that. But but we don't we want to keep it clean, okay? So so I apologize. My guy is obviously on a date. Um, we'll see if he has a job tomorrow. But uh, but Erta and everyone, it, it's it's so nice to see all of you again, and. Um, Thanks so much for having me. It's been really super. Thank you. And John, you would you wouldn't mind us to post the recording online. We have a yeah web page. No problem. Uh, no problem at all. No, sure. Go ahead. Great. And uh, how next, about the slides? Also the slides. Uh, can we also post yeah, the slides? Yeah, you can have my slides if you'd like them. Sure. Thanks. So for those of you who are still staying with us, we also. Um, uh, have a web page of the event, and we next uh, month we're going to have Colin Cameron speaking with us, and I look forward to seeing many of you there. Uh, thanks very much again, uh, John, and uh, I hope I see you next year. Hopefully, um, that sounds good. That sounds <laughs> good. Have fun with Colin. Colin's great. Um, so thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Okay, have a good day. Thanks. Thanks, John. Bye.